This video is on nerve supply of parotid gland. Besides nerve supply, we will also consider the anatomical basis of Frey's syndrome. Parotid gland is supplied by three types of nerve fibers and these are parasympathetic fibers which are secretomotor in nature. So they are responsible for secretion of saliva from the parotid gland. Next we have sympathetic fibers. They also provide innervation to the secretory units of the parotid gland but mainly they are vasomotor. That means they will be supplying the blood vessels which are supplying parotid gland uh, their smooth muscles. And then we have the third type that is the sensory fibers which will carry general sensations like pain, touch, heat, cold. So those fibers would be there. Now besides uh, the parenchyma of the parotid gland, the skin over the parotid gland that receives nerve supply from a uh, great auricular nerve. So this great auricular nerve, this arises from the cervical plexus. Its root value is uh, C2, C3 ventral rami and this will supply not only it will carry the sensations from the skin, this will also supply the sweat glands which are present in the skin over the parotid gland. So let's start with the parasympathetic fibers. I've already told you these are secretomotor in nature. So which cranial nerve will provide these secretomotor fibers? It is glossopharyngeal nerve. Just to remind you, there are lots of exocrine glands in the head region like lacrimal gland, nasal glands, palatine glands, and the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. All these glands will receive their secretomotor fibers from facial nerve except parotid which receives secretomotor fibers from glossopharyngeal nerve. Now let us see this is parasympathetic innervation so there will be two neurons involved in this pathway preganglionic and postganglionic. So we will see where exactly the preganglionic neurons of this secretomotor pathway are located. In this diagram we can see here this is the brainstem with midbrain pons and medulla oblongata. We can see here a nucleus here of the cranial nerve glossopharyngeal nerve that is inferior salivatory nucleus. So it is not difficult to remember salivatory it is involved in salivation. Why inferior? Because facial nerve will have superior salivatory nucleus. So this inferior salivatory nucleus will have the preganglionic secretomotor fibers and these fibers will traverse through or pass through the glossopharyngeal nerve. Now the glossopharyngeal nerve will leave the cranial cavity through a foramen known as jugular foramen. After this it will give a branch and that branch is known as tympanic branch. So this branch is going to as the name suggests you can see here this branch will re-enter right through the base of skull into the middle ear cavity through a small canaliculus known as tympanic canaliculus and when it reaches the medial wall of the middle ear cavity it is going to form tympanic plexus. So now it is clear. So uh, which nerve will be given from the glossopharyngeal nerve? Tympanic branch and this will be where located where? This will enter where? middle ear cavity or tympanic cavity and it forms a plexus there that is tympanic plexus. Now from the tympanic plexus a nerve will arise and this nerve is lesser petrosal nerve. The name petrosal that means it is going to pierce the roof of the tympanic cavity which is formed by the petrous bone there. So there it will pierce and will enter middle ear cranial fossa. Now from there it will leave the cranial cavity via this foramen which is foramen ovale. And then it is going to relay in the otic ganglion which is located in infratemporal fossa. So this is the course of the preganglionic fibers. From inferior salivatory nucleus the fibers enter glossopharyngeal nerve. Glossopharyngeal nerve leaves the cranial cavity through jugular foramen. It gives a branch known as tympanic branch which enters the tympanic cavity and forms a plexus over the medial wall of the tympanic cavity known as tympanic plexus. From there the lesser petrosal nerve arises, pierces the roof of middle ear cavity and then it uh, runs a course in the middle cranial fossa and leaves that middle cranial fossa through foramen ovale and just below that we have infratemporal fossa where we have otic ganglion. So this will relay in the otic ganglion. Now begin the 
post ganglionic fibers and these post ganglionic fibers they will reach the parotid gland and the nerve through which they are going to reach that nerve is auriculotemporal nerve now next let us see about the sympathetic fibers now sympathetic fibers from where they will come sympathetic flow is thoracolumbar flow right that is sympathetic preganglionic neurons are located only from t1 to l1 spinal segments and almost all of the head receives its sympathetic supply from t1 spinal segment so here we can see from the t1 spinal segment its lateral horn the preganglionic neurons they will arise they will ascend up in the sympathetic chain and they are going to synapse where in the superior cervical ganglion and after that the postganglionic fibers uh, sympathetic fibers usually what they do is they wind around the blood vessels because they have to supply the blood vessels they are vasomotor so if they have to reach any part where they have to give the supply that is by going around the forming a plexus around the blood vessels so it form a will form a plexus around external carotid artery then its branch that is maxillary artery then further its branch that is middle meningeal artery which is very close to otic ganglion now from there the sympathetic fibers the postganglionic fibers will pass through the otic ganglion but they will not synapse there right and supply the parotid gland again by passing through auriculotemporal now now the last type of fibers that is the sensory fibers these sensory fibers they will reach the parotid gland via which nerve through a branch of mandibular nerve this nerve also passes through foramen obliquus and it divides into anterior division and a posterior division one of the branches of posterior division is auriculotemporal nerve so this is going to provide the sensory innervation the other two types of uh, fibers also pass along with the auriculotemporal nerve now the skin over the parotid gland that is supplied by great auricular nerve as i have already told you let us look at now the uh, anatomical basis of frey syndrome so let us first see what exactly is frey syndrome now here in this picture we can see the skin over the parotid gland that is reddish in appearance and it has beads of sweat are there perspiration is there so what exactly is frey syndrome when a patient eats beads of perspiration or sweat appear on the skin over parotid gland or temporal region so normally when we chew the food or masticate saliva is produced so along with this saliva what will happen the sweat will be also produced on the skin covering the parotid gland so why this happens now first of all let us see what is the cause for this right so what happens is sometimes during the parotid surgery or due in some accidental surgeries or maybe lacerations caused by sharp objects like knives there right or in accidents if uh, there is a deep uh, cut in the parotid region then what happens is the nerves which supply the parotid gland and the skin over the parotid gland they got cut now all peripheral nerves they uh, regenerate so during regeneration something happens because of which the frey syndrome is produced now normally let us see what happens here is that we can see here this is there are two nerves can be seen this is the auriculotemporal nerve and all the three types of fibers can be seen parasympathetic secretomotor sympathetic vasomotor and the sensory which are supplying the parotid gland there is another nerve which we can see here which is supplying the sweat glands in the skin over the parotid gland right so this is the normal uh, way that is great auricular nerve carries postganglionic sympathetic fibers to sweat glands and auriculotemporal nerve carries postganglionic parasympathetic fibers to parotid gland this is the normal now next what happens if there is a cut or injury here right both these nerves are cut the auriculotemporal nerve as well as the great auricular nerve now what will happen during regeneration what happens when the nerves are cut then the distal part of the axons they will degenerate but the endoneural sheaths the schwann shells which are already there they are going to form endoneural sheaths like pipelines and the proximal ends of the axons they proliferate they give many branches and they will enter into these endoneural sheaths wherever they find 
now here in this case what happens during regeneration the parasympathetic fibers which can be seen here they grow into the endoneural sheath uh, which are actually meant for the uh, branches from the great auricular nerve and supply the sweat gland so what will happen whenever uh, a person chews the food or sees the food or smells the food which is good so there will be salivation now along with the salivation what will happen along with the salivation the sweat will be also produced on the skin covering the parotid gland so that's what happens during regeneration secretomotor fibers of auriculotemporal nerve they will also supply the sweat glands of the skin covering the parotid gland as a result when the person eats food beads of sweat appear on the skin because the stimulus which is intended for salivation produces sweat also so that's all for this video thanks for watching and if you have not subscribed please subscribe my channel so that i can put more such videos and if you want uh, the questions and answers in anatomy all types of that then visit the website that is anatomyqa.com thanks once again